Making music for TV shows, streaming services like Netflix, and brands is a great way to make money. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I've had dozens of songs placed in documentaries and shows on broadcast TV and just about every streaming service out there. And I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. So today, let's go over some of the lessons that I've learned after making hundreds of songs for Sync, and I'll even break down the difference in pay between broadcast TV and streaming services on my latest BMI statement, which isn't exactly pretty. So let's dive in and uncover some uncomfortable truths about making Sync music. First off, let's talk cash. I remember hearing stories from the early 2000s of brands paying tens of thousands of dollars to artists for commercial music on their first go-round. Back then, the dream for just about every musician was to get signed to a label, make records, and tour the world like rock stars. So most people weren't thinking about sync. But you'd hear rumors about UPS or Nike paying these indie bands $40,000 for background music for a commercial. And while there are still huge paydays like that out there, there are way more fish in the sea these days. So now that just about every artist is hip to sync music, you're not going to just waltz in and make six figures off your first deal. Another important facet of sync music is that your income will be pretty feast or famine, especially at first. If you're aiming to make it your full-time gig, you should still have some other income sources lined up. Royalties are paid on a quarterly basis, so you aren't going to see any mailbox money for the first few months, and your first few royalty checks will probably have uh, not a comma in them, to say the least. There are projects where I've made a 45 second song for four figures, and then a few weeks later, you may be hired to make an entire album for just a few hundred dollars up front, with almost all of the payment coming as back in royalties. You can really end up in a bind when you spend that big paycheck on something silly. So be smart with your money and make sure to save some for a rainy day or a slow month. That's not to say that you can't make money in sync music because you obviously can. One of the best things about it is getting checks every quarter for music that you made months or even years ago. But one thing that I think you should be wary of is people trying to exploit your desire for mailbox money to sell you a product or a service that you may not need. While there are countless paid courses, mastermind groups, and subscription-based pitching services out there, and all of them have great testimonials about clients who landed massive placements, I'd caution against putting too much stock into those types of services. If someone is asking you for money in exchange for the opportunity to pitch a song, that's usually a red flag in my book. If you're not sure about a service, just Google the name of the company and the word scam and see what comes up. In my own personal opinion, the money that a library makes should probably be coming from the client side, the network that's looking for music. Expecting the artist to pay into your library in exchange for the chance to be selected for vague briefs, well, that kind of sketches me out. So before you put your credit card information into a bunch of websites, have a good hard think about what you're getting in return for your money. When it comes to courses and business groups, I think there are two sides to the coin. On one side, there are people who have solid information, good music, and they wanna offer it up to students in exchange for some money. And I've got no problem with that. Education is an important part of music, and I don't think that we should discourage people from getting paid to teach what they know. On the other hand, there is an entire cottage industry built around taking money from hopeful musicians in exchange for information that you can usually find for free online. If someone is offering you the framework to level up your sync music business and the secrets to unlock a vault of massive royalty checks, all for the low, low price of $10,000, well, I'd suggest you run as fast as you can. There's nothing so secret about sync music that you need to pay someone the price of a used car for them to explain it to you. And speaking of money, one nice thing about sync is that you can usually do what you need to do without spending all your money on an expensive gear list or a massive studio. A good pair of headphones, a solid laptop, and a MIDI keyboard is enough gear to make some really great cues these days. If you can build your software instrument libraries and your sample libraries, 
You'll have most of what you need to make orchestral cues, hip hop and electronic tracks, and more. Another big plus of sync music is that you can do it on your own schedule. Since you're not working on producing for other artists, you can write in your pajamas at 10 p.m. You can get up early and knock out a few songs before the sun is out. Basically, you're free to work however you like, as long as you get the tracks done on time. On the flip side, one thing to keep in mind when you're working on sync music is that you need your music to come together somewhat quickly. If you're new to producing and it takes you 10, 20, or 40 hours to write and record a song, that's not going to be super sustainable. This is for two main reasons. For one, there are lots of tight turnaround times. I'll often just have two or three weeks to turn in an entire album, and there are crunch time projects where you'll need to turn in a song practically overnight. Second, you'll pretty much be killing your margins if it takes you forever to make a song. If you can turn out a quality song in a few hours, and there's a deal that's worth $100 up front, plus royalties on the back end, you'll make $25, $35 an hour just on the recording. If that same song takes you three days, then you're basically working for minimum wage or less. This isn't saying that you need to totally rush your recordings and turn in something subpar, because that will not get you anywhere. But it's more about developing your skills to the point where you can turn out high quality music without overthinking, tinkering, and chasing your tail all day long. So if you're still new and it takes you a long time to make music, don't take this as a sign to give up because that speed is something that you will earn with months or years of hard work sharpening your skills, but you can totally get there and make it happen. Another thing that new producers may not realize is that you shouldn't use any loops in your sync songs. Besides maybe a super basic shaker or a tambourine loop, you really should stick to one shots off a of splice, layering cinematic drum loop 01 over cinematic bass loop 03 with cinematic horns loop 12 isn't composing, and it can actually land you in some hot water. A few years back, all of the major libraries had to issue a warning that they were banning loops from compositions because too many songs were getting turned in with the same loops. If two different composers turn in songs where the intro to the song is just a drum loop, who gets the credit and the payment when a TV show licenses that song and then just uses the intro? With that said, if you're used to making beats with lots of loops in them, it is a great idea to get in the habit of making your own loops. So now let's talk about the difference between streaming and TV broadcasts. As an example, let's talk about the pay that I got for a song on a TLC show called Hillsong, a megachurch exposed. This one track made me a little over $16 last quarter during its cable airings, which isn't bad. Now, here's the stats for the same song streaming on demand on the platform Max, under $4. And for comparison, here are four placements in the Netflix show Baking Impossible, and that somehow netted me $1.92 for all four songs combined. Now, to be transparent, I did get paid an upfront fee to write these tracks, so it's not like I made four songs for a dollar each. That's just to show the difference in royalties between the different types of broadcasts. As you can tell, sync is definitely a numbers game, and your royalty statements will reflect the total number of songs and placements that you can get over time. Once you have hundreds or even thousands of placements, these checks will really start to add up. But it also underscores the importance of building a resume for yourself so that you can start working on projects that pay up front as well as on the back end. And last but not least, if you're getting into sync music, make sure that you read the contracts and the agreements before you sign anything and have a lawyer look over them if you don't understand the terms. Besides protecting yourself, it will also make sure that you don't make any big mistakes. For example, you need to understand if you're signing an exclusive deal or a non-exclusive deal. If you mess up and you accidentally give tracks that are already locked into an exclusive agreement, to other libraries, or you sign away your back-end royalties without realizing, then you will definitely end up regretting it. The terms of any given deal will often play a big part in whether or not the deal is worth doing, so make sure that you understand what you are and aren't getting paid for before you commit to a project. So 
That's the real truth about writing sync music. So if you're ready to take the dive and start working on sync music yourself, then check out this video right here because it'll teach you everything you need to know to get started and land your first sync placements.